okay, I am not going to allow you to say it to yourself. We're going to sit here and have to deal with it, right? But that story that you just said that like, oh, like if I commit to this project, it's going to be more boring. You know, I'm going to, it's going to be drudgery. What you basically said is that you have a failure of imagination about how you can't find wonder daily in this work. That's what you've told me. So you're telling me you, you, this hyper creative visionary person can't find wonder and curiosity and joy and love in this project on a daily day basis. Sometimes people tell me, hey, David, The Heart to Start is a great book, but now that I've figured out how to start, how do I finish? And if you're anything like me, finishing is tough. You can always find a good reason not to finish what you've started. It's not fun anymore. You don't want to paint yourself into a corner if it goes well. Or my personal favorite, now you have an even better idea, which you will soon abandon like the thousands of projects before it. Our guest today can help you stop floundering and start finishing. In fact, he's author of the book called Start Finishing, How to Go from Idea to Done. He's got all the discipline of an army officer, all the wisdom of a philosophy professor. He's even been both of those things. He's Charlie Gilkey. Whether you're flip-flopping, floundering, or fluttering from project to project like a butterfly in a botanical garden, Charlie can help you start finishing with his book or start flourishing with his podcast, Productive Flourishing. Today, we're going to talk to Charlie about, first of all, he says, be courageous enough to commit more fully to fewer projects. Now, for lots of us, that is a lot easier said than done. We're going to hear Charlie psychoanalyze me out of my own straitjacket. And finishing a big project changes who we are. How can you push past your comfort zone just when you're about to make a transformation? And you've heard of fear of success. I've always had trouble believing in it, but Charlie cleared it all up for me. Here are the four stories we tell ourselves that hold us back from success. And Charlie is the last guest for a while. I'm going to repeat that. Charlie is the last guest for a while. I am dedicating every bit of creative energy to my upcoming book, Mind Management, Not Time Management. Remember, the preview edition is available for a limited time at kdv.co slash mind. I'm still going to be workshopping ideas from the book in my bi-weekly essay episodes, so do stay subscribed for those. And interestingly, since Charlie is all about finishing, and I'm on the home stretch for finishing this book, that makes him the perfect final guest. Here is Charlie Gilkey. I'm here with Charlie Gilkey, who is author of Start Finishing, How to Go from Idea to Done. And I loved coming across this book, Start Finishing, because I wrote a book called The Heart to Start, which a lot of people have found useful. But then there's been a lot of people who've said, hey, you know, starting's the easy part for me. I can't finish. So what is it that is so hard about finishing that might not quite be so hard about starting? Well, first off, David, thanks so much for having me on the show. So it's a huge honor. So thank you. Yeah. It's hard to say what one thing is hard about finishing because the process of doing what I call your best work, which is that work that your soul really claims to do, a lot of us call it our creative work or our craft. One of the major challenges that it brings to us is that while we're in the middle of creating it, we're also creating ourselves. And in that process, we go into so many realms of uncertainty, so many realms of recreating ourselves and who we are, that it can get pretty murky. What I will say, though, is that one of the reasons it's hard to finish versus hard to start is we can all start a project without any sort of bearing on what our real world looks like. But the second we actually start going about doing that work, we realize, wait a second, something is going on here. And the way I like to talk about it is projects are both mirrors and bridges. They're mirrors because they reflect what's going on in our inner world and they reflect what's going on in our outer world. And so we take on this new great project. We're fired up. We're pumped up. The second we start working on it, the second we convert it from an idea into a project, 
our reality is reflected back to us. And maybe we don't have the time that we thought we did. Maybe we have these 16 other projects that we didn't think about when we did this. Maybe um, those fears and the head trash that we all have, that's when that starts comes up and it starts reflecting how we think about ourselves and the really crappy stories we have about ourselves. And so we sort of go through, for lack of better words, this existential journey when, when it comes to doing the type of best work projects that we're talking about. The second reason I'll say that they're a bridge is it's only by completing these sort of best work projects that we build the bridge between our current reality and the life and the world we most want to live in. And if you're stuck, it's probably, if you're stuck in your life and you're stuck in your work, it's probably because you're not focused on those, focusing on those projects, focusing on finishing those projects that are going to bridge that gap. So I liked what you said. You said, as we're creating it, we're also creating ourself. I feel like I can relate to that so much because I'm one of these people who approaches projects very intuitively where I don't even know what it is until I've created it. And then through the process of creating, and I find that it has changed me. Can you expand upon that idea a little bit more? Yeah. Well, I mean, you've already mentioned it, but so let's talk about a few ways in which we create ourselves. So the I've already mentioned head trash as one of the major challenges that keeps us from doing the work we're called to do these best work projects. The thing about our head trash is that it's just, well, excuse me, our head trash are those stories those limiting beliefs, the cultural background stuff that we pick up that often create these really terrible narratives about ourselves. And when you are actually in the process of creating a and finishing a project, those narratives that you have about, about yourself start to change. Sometimes they're reinforced. Sometimes they're removed. Like I know so many writers, David, who no matter how many blog posts or articles or books they've written, when they sit down to write, their head trash comes up and says, man, you're a terrible writer. <laughs> what are you doing? Right? And so on and so forth. And, and it's like, how many books do you have to write before you really get over that? And yet it comes up over and over again. And the thing about it is your head trash does not have to be true of the world for it to do its work on you. And that's important because, or why this is important, because as you're finishing that project, you're confronting this deeply embedded story that you have about yourself and creating a new version of yourself that is either more tied to that story or less tied to that story. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one thing that it does. The other thing is that by finishing some of these types of projects, you end up in a smaller cadre of humanity that maybe you've always wanted to be in. So, you know, you've always wanted to write the book. You wrote the book. Now you're in this small group of, of humans that have written a book. And it's a really small percentage of the of human existence, right, of people who have written a book. And maybe that book goes on to be a bestseller. You're in an even smaller category of books. And so how you relate to yourself and the world and humanity has also shifted as well. And then there's the process of self-discovery where you just walk away from some of these projects. I wouldn't say a wholly different person. There are some experiences in life, like maybe having kids and going to war and, you know, things like that, that it really is an identity shift in, in that particular experience shifts you. But you're enough different that you look back on yourself and can think, wow, like I did that. This is who I am. I can do, I can do these types of things. What does that mean about the rest of my life? What does that mean about what I should do now? What should I update now? And so you are, you've gone through a peak experience and have come out the other side, a different person in, in some small or large measure. And then that way you've created yourself. So I'm going to dig more into this idea of there being kind of a transformation that happens. You cross this, this threshold. I, I mean, I can relate to that so much. The, the me before I wrote my first book and the me after I wrote my first book or, or any of, any of the books or any projects that I've created that have the ones that have been difficult anyway, you, you do change. It, it changes your identity. It changes your beliefs about yourself. But I, I want to uh, hear more about this term best work. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So your best work, and, and the reason I had to talk about best work is because I think um, we've gotten into sort of bad relationships with the word work and that it's like many of the other four letter words in the English language. Like, you know, so many of our crass words are actually four letters long. Don't know how that happened. It just did. <laughs> and so we don't want to talk about it. We want to get away from it. We want to minimize it. We want to crunch it. You know, it's not what we want to wake up in the morning and deal with. That's many people's connotation to the word work. Except 
some of us have some kinds of work that we are, feel the exact opposite about. It's work we want to get up and do. It's the work we'll steal time from. It's the work that when we do it, we feel like we cheated somebody like our employer because we were doing this work and they paid us. And how did that happen? Don't tell anyone I enjoy this work that much or they'll let me or they'll figure it out. Right. And so I wanted to demarcate that type of best work, but I didn't want to like get rid of the word work because I think a lot of times we get caught in sort of a, sort of a creative passion trap to where we think, Oh, if you're inspired by it, if you're called to do it, it should be easy. It should just be something right. that flows from you. And someone's like, no, it's still work, <laughs> right? It's still, and it is that some, sometimes the hardest or most, I want to say this, it's the most difficult work you will do, right? I discriminate between hard and difficult, but that may be a, conver- a, a next question. But so best work, let's talk about it. One, it's work that you really do want to do, that you're called to it in a certain way. And everyone I know, David, has tucked away some idea, some project in the closet of their soul and have told themselves like, when I get time or when I have the money mm-hmm. or when, when I have a better boss, I'm going to get, I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to get to do that thing. Well, that's probably giving you a call to what your best work is. Second thing about best work is it is something only you can do. Other people may be close to it. They might, you know, write a book like your first book, David, but they're not going to write your book in your way. It's your unique fr- fingerprint of energy on the world when you complete that type of work. I mean, it, at the same time, if you don't complete it, the world misses out of that unique fingerprint, that unique voice. Do you feel like there's a distinction then between the, and this might be too big of a question for the, for the moment, I don't want to interrupt your, uh, your next thought, but a distinction between what it's like to try to finish the work at, at work and the work that's your best work. Like, are the challenges uniquely, unique of of one another? No, I wouldn't say so. Well, they're not necessarily unique. And let me say it this way. You might be a hobbyist musician and the music may be your best work. It's not what you get paid for. It doesn't have to be, you know, with that that pays the bills. And if you do enough of that work, guess what? You will encounter the same challenges that you'll face in the work that you do at the office. Mm, Oh, yeah. Right? And so it's not fundamentally different in that way. What's different about best work, well, there's many different things. There's a a list, but it's hard for so many of us to give ourselves permission to do our best work. Like the world usually is not sitting there saying, okay, David, here's the thing. That thing you must want to do, we want you to do that too. Right right now. (laughs) Go Mm -hmm. do it. Right? Here's your permission slip. Bing. We want it. That's not the way it works. Other people come to you with the stuff they want you to do that solves their dilemma. Their, you know, I call it OPP, other people's projects. Um, they come to you with their projects that they want you to be a supporting actor on. And so there's just no one that's sitting there waiting on you saying like, David, go do your thing, right? And so we end up in this position because of the type of beings that we are, the collective social beings that we are, we end up so much prioritizing what other people want us to do and what other people think is the right thing for us to do and what other people place value on. And there we are with our little nerdy, dorky, weird, creative, funky, whatever thing that we're doing. And we're like, yeah, but like, I just can't do that. I need to do all this other stuff or it doesn't make sense. Or I'm going to be in a van down by the river or who am I to do this type of work? Or I'm not good enough or all these sort of like things. And that's the thing about about these types of best work projects and ideas. Like, you know, I say in the book that the more it matters to you, the more you'll thrash. And by thrash, I mean all of that emotional meta work and flailing and rummaging that we'll do around something that doesn't actually push that work forward. It's largely a bunch of stories. But notice that like we don't thrash about doing the dishes or taking the laundry out or doing it or doing the laundry or taking the trash out. We either do or we don't. We might procrastinate, but we don't fall into sort of a pseudo existential crisis about it. Yes, yes. It's only the things that truly matter to us that we're getting that. And another sort of layering of concepts here is that in my world, if it takes time, energy, and attention, it's a project. I don't discriminate between work projects or creative projects or life projects or like getting married is a project. Getting divorced is a project. Having kids project, you know, all those types of things, cleaning out that closet that never gets cleaned out. You know why it's not cleaned up? Because you haven't made it a project. That's why it's not getting done. So when we understand 
that there are these types of projects in our life that will really create this thrashing moment that will really make us wonder if we're the right person for it or it's the right thing for us. For me, that's a clue that something truly matters to you within that. Because otherwise you'd be numb to it. It'd be taking out the trash or going to get groceries or whatever sort of mundane you do. But those things that make you thrash are a clue that you're onto something that matters to you. Yeah, if it wasn't important to you, then you wouldn't even feel any sort of tension around that you would just be doing the, oh, I love that, the OPP, other people's projects. And it's, it's funny, yeah, you can you can procrastinate on taking out the trash or doing the dishes, but then you can also procrastinate on your best work, on your novel, on on these things that you supposedly want to do, that you dream of doing. I call it aspiration procrastination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really unusual that, or it's counterintuitive that we would procrastinate on these things. And so I guess, I mean, is, is that a place where there's a distinction then between what we run into trying to finish our best work versus trying to finish the work that is OPP? I think so. Part of our best work is, and kind of in the thread that we've been talking about here, one of the reasons it scares us so much is that that sneaking fear that, of failure that we have creeps up and is like, well, if I can't complete this project, if I don't do well about this project, what does it say about me and my identity? Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas we normally don't like in most low pressure sort of virtual meetings at this point. Right. You know, a team leaders talking or someone's talking like you can weigh in or you're not like it doesn't really matter. You're not putting yourself out there. Right. In a major way. And so we can do those without sort of that fear of identity shifts, without that fear of how people will see us, without that fear of shame or regret and things like that that, that come up when we do best work projects. But the reason we hold on to that book that we've been working on for four years and we're at that 98% mark is because we know once we get it out there, once we ship it, that we're out there, our identity, who we are, what we care about most deeply, you know, aside from kids and family, is out there to be judged. (laughs) It's out there and you can't take it back. And so actually, that's one of the reasons it's so different because in just in normal work, the identity is at stake. Someone asks you to do something, you do it. They're happy. You're happy. Nothing has really shifted, right? But telling that person no, that starts to shift some things. Going and presenting work to that person that's above and beyond what they might want or different than what they might want, that shifts a relationship because we're always in these co-creative relationships with people. And people think their identity is something that we say like, I'm Charlie Gilkey. This is who I am. It's not really the way it works. Right. My identity is held in a co-creative conversation with everyone around me. Right. So I don't get to be Charlie Gilkey without David Kadavi having a having a say, having a perception and maybe changing who that is. And so that's why when we do this type of best work and public work, when we produce something in the world, we're always testing the boundaries of these relationships and who we are and who we might be. And As humans, we are just really uncomfortable with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we put out. Like if I put out this, what next? What happens next? What what do I do? What if I can't live up to it? What if it changes who I am? So we say, you know what? Ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) Too many Mm -hmm. questions. I can just check out a few emails and get that done and then feel like I got something done today. Well, you consult with a lot of people. You you, you help a lot of people finish projects. Do you find a different personalities or styles, approaches to having a struggle with finishing? Yeah, I really do. So, you know, I talk about the air sandwich in chapter two of the book, right? And the air sandwich are is kind of like you see, imagine the top slice of bread being your vision, your values, your goals, sort of that best version of your life and work that you can imagine. Okay, that's a top layer of bread. Mm-hmm. The bottom layer of bread is the day-to-day reality and grind. And for a lot of people, there's a lot, there's a big gap between that top layer of bread and that bottom layer of bread. And so that's why I call it the air sandwich. Except the air sandwich is an illusion um, because in between there are sort of five core human challenges that come over, up over and over again. Competing priorities, head trash, no realistic plan, too few resources, poor team alignment. And the reason... You know, I could say on the one hand that those are sort of universal challenges that come up and over and over again that we all face in different ways. But some of us are more combated by some of those challenges than others. 
Obviously, if you have a lot of means, you have a lot of time, you have a lot of money, the too few resources thing may not be the challenge that you have come up. You might, you more likely have competing priorities, right? Hmm. If, you know, you've got a great team, you don't have the poor team alignment, you might have no realistic plan. So you really have to sort of pick where you are in those. And so as I work with people, one of the first things I do is do sort of an informal audit to see which of those are the most weighty. And I'll tell you what, David, the two go-to places that I'll start with until I figure out that that's not it are competing priorities and head trash, hmm. right? Um, people um, either starting off too many different projects and getting tied up because the projects are tugging on them at the same time that the responsibilities in life are tugging on them and time is doing what time does. And so they feel stuck and they're not making the progress. Or they've got so much that they could do but there's their head trash is governing what they can do. I think so many people look to the external world and say, if I just had that, if I just had that, then, you know, I would be able to do something. But it's kind of like people think that if they soup up this engine of the car that they're driving, that they'll be able to drive it faster and better. But the car already goes plenty fast. They're just driving like it's a golf cart because that's their comfort with the world and their own self-mastery. It doesn't matter how much we work on the engine. They're just going to drive it like a golf cart. Yeah. One way that I've thought about it a little bit, and I know Myers-Briggs gets a lot of crap for being pseudoscience. I happen to think it's useful, especially the P and the J part, Mm -hmm. the perceiver versus judger. Mm -hmm. And perceivers being the people who, they're open to possibilities. They're always, they hate to close doors. The J's being the executors that can kind of go top down on something and follow a series of steps and get it done. Like I'm, I feel like I'm a hopeless P. And in some ways, like embracing that has helped me because it's helped me make adjustments in my approach to finishing things to understand that, okay, well, don't feel so bad. Don't, don't let head trash build up because you have competing priorities. Just learn how to uh, accept the fact that there's certain priorities that are just low priority. Like you, you worked on that other project that you had shiny object syndrome and you worked on it and it turned out to not be that important and that's fine. But I, I can be, it can be a double-edged sword because then you can also have this identi- identity as like, oh, I'm a P, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm scatterbrained. I, 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 I jump from project to project. I have competing priorities. I have a lot of, a lot of shiny object syndrome, I guess is what people call it. And, and that's where I see something like in the book where it says, be courageous enough to commit more fully to fewer projects. I read that sentence and I'm like, man, I wish I could do that. Because I see friends who do that, who are J's, <laughs> and I just see how they're able to go an inch wide, a mile deep on something, and I just can't do it as much as I try. And so the be courageous enough to commit more fully to fewer projects, I mean, I, I need to, to let go of that. I, I can't say that I can't do it. I'm, I'm working on it. I have a growth mindset about it. It's hard. <laughs> I'll go that far. How do you do it? First off, I want to say it's hard. It just is, right? And I think even the Jays, well, the Jays on that side need to practice a little more courage around going into uncertainty and being less rigid. Uh, yeah. Right? Right. And so that that's part of it. And I'm glad that you recognize that the I can't, it creates a scenario where you won't. You know, so I'm saying I can't do that. So I, what I experience from so many of the hyper creative people that I, that I work on or that I work with, I should say, also work on, but that's another matter, is that the urge to do a bunch of things and the inability to commit to fewer projects, there's several things going on under that. Yeah. One is usually a three or four levels deeper fear that they're going to pick the wrong thing and it's not going to work out. So they're kind of hedging their bets. That if they do multiple things, like one of them is going to pan out and it won't all be a waste of time. Yep. Whereas if they commit to one big thing, like what if it doesn't work? Right. So that's another one. The second thing is there's we hum- like to be to be a woke human means that we sit in a lot of tensions. And that's just we can't resolve those tensions. We hope that we can, but we can't. And one of those tensions is on the one hand, our love of novelty. And on the other, our love of routine and certainty. Both happen to be true for us at the same time. 
And so going to sort of the P side, there's that novelty of getting to be a new thing or getting to do a new things and the puzzling and exploration and the sort of fun that happens behind that. And sort of the fear can sometimes be, well, if I commit to just a one thing, what happens when it's no longer fun and interesting mm. and it becomes work? Yeah. And then I have to show up and be behind that. And that doesn't sound fun. Like there's a fear that committing to a fewer number of projects is simultaneously committing to, say, drudgery or boringness or, you know, having to fight themselves. It's almost like that's that fear of success thing that I hear so much about where I'm just like, what are you talking about? Fear of success, it makes no sense. But I guess that kind of does make it make sense is that you're afraid that of the five things that you're doing, this is going to become the one thing. And now you're successful at it. And so now you've got to do that. And then it becomes boredom and drudgery. Well, that, and I'm glad you made, you picked up, you picked up the fear of success because later on in the book, I talk about the, the, um, three, it's three in the books, but it's actually four. So I need to tell you about the fourth one, but the three no win scenarios that we tell ourselves. And the no win scenarios are basically where we set up this, the situation where if we're successful, there's some huge cost that we're unwilling to accept or to accept. And because we're unwilling to accept that cost, we're not really going to do our best on this project, but at the same time, we don't want to fail because failure is bad. And so we end up shooting for this gray mediocrity where we're neither really successful nor really failing because that's the safest emotional option for us. And so those three slash four are one, the first one is success will wreck my relationships. So if I'm successful, then I'm going to have to, you know, I'm not going to be the type of parent or the type of you know, dad or a husband or friend, like, because we know what successful people become, right? They become distanced from everyone that they love and people can't, unrelatable and their relationships fall apart. So we have embedded deep inside of us that success equals wrecking relationships. Relationships are really important to most of us. And so we don't push that edge of success because we love the people around us. The second story is that success will come at the cost of my integrity or character. Because we know nice guys finish last, right? We know that I'm not going to sell out. I'm know? not going to sell out, you know, and like real artists starve. And, you know, all those different myths that basically are saying success comes at the cost of character and integrity. And you can't be successful and be a good, you know, integrous, virtuous person. The third story is success will trap me into it will trap me into a scenario to where I can never beat myself and it's just a fall, a far fall from grace. So what if I succeed really big? I have to live up to that again. And if I don't... Oh, you got to follow it up. Yeah. You got to follow it up. I and mean, then the fourth story is success will cost me my health, my well-being, my sanity. And so I, to succeed, I've got to crush it and got to push it and lead, lead to burnout. Look at all the successful people who just, yeah, end up drug addicts or just ruined relationships, et cetera, right? Yeah, so, and, so, and so we have those deeply embedded stories and it's because we've seen them. We've seen yeah. them play out for other people. Plenty of examples, yeah. And so that's, I, you know, I get specific about what fear of success talk means. Like you're going to wreck relationships. You're going to become, you know, a schmuck. You're going to, you know, not be able to top yourself and forever be chasing a high you can never follow up or you're going to burn yourself out. And when that is what we deeply think success is about, of course, we won't commit to being epically successful with any one thing. Yeah. Right. Of course, we'll hedge our bets and sort of be able to put, quote, life, work life balance up in the air as a reason for why we're not really pushing and living full tilt. Of course, we're going to make these choices over and over again. But the thing about it is, we all also know individual people who have managed to be successful and have great relationships. They've managed to be successful and be the most saintly people that you ever know, the nicest people, most generous people. We know people who have been able to either top their own work or just get to a place of prolificness where they're like, you know what, I'm just creating and letting it go and letting it go, right? Or people who are still healthy and happy and sane that are in a creative flow. We know, we know at least one person that fits every one of those bills. But we don't believe we can be that person, or at least that's not the archetype for who we could be. I mean, it's tough because I've felt all of these things, and sometimes you really, maybe my attitudes have changed on some of them. I mean, sometimes you're, you're, you're just so convinced you're in this straight jacket that, you know, such and such thing is going to be selling out, or at least I'm not stooping to such and such level. 
that this person's doing who's who's really successful you know at least i at least i have my integrity at least you know i'm i'm doing quality work but it, it's just hasn't you know i haven't gotten as good as i'm gonna get and you you tell these things and like you're just convinced that you're right and maybe in some ways you are right but somewhere they're in there there's just a bunch of bullshit and it's just hard to untangle from that straitjacket how do you get out of it so here's where having a philosophical background comes in handy is all it takes is one instance to violate that that rule that nice guys finish last right that's the rule nice guys finish last yeah for example yeah yeah how many nice guys do you know that have won <laughs> right how many how much evidence do you need to pack up that that's a possibility before you can break that logical sort of head trash and bullshit that you've got. Mm. Well, it's hard to do because once you admit it, then you have to realize, well, gosh, I'm a nice guy. And I guess I'm a failure because if nice guys finish last isn't true and I'm still not successful, then that means that I fail. Right. So that's makes that you got that clutch on there. I've got the clutch on there, but here's what I'll say about that. Like failure is an event. It's not a character trait. And so, yes, in the past, maybe you have not been as successful as you could have been, but it doesn't mean that going forward, you can't be, Mm -hmm. right? Because maybe in the past, why you weren't successful is because you believed the very thing that you just figured out was false, or at least not absolutely true of you. And that's the really, like, people get really pissed at me, David. I I get (laughs) uninvited from a lot of parties because- I love it. (laughs) Because at a certain point, you realize- shit, this is me. Like I, I, at a certain point I have to take personal responsibility. And and what I want to say about personal responsibility is like, yes, life has handed all of us different sets of cards, right? I grew up poor and multiracial in the South in the eighties. It was not a good, it was not a good hand to be dealt, you know? Mm. So I get that. I get, I'm not saying that any, that we all are running at the same rate or have the same amount of privilege. I'm not at all saying that, but at a certain point, we have to look at ourselves and say, you know what? Like the reason I'm in this position is because of the way that I make choices and prioritize and ask for what I want and get up early, whatever those things are, right? And that, when I teach workshops, David, like I can almost program it that there's a night where I just know that it's going to be emotional breakdown for a third of the people. Wow. Right. Not when the breakdown might be a little, a little hard. Like, is this like the moment that they have to decide between accountability and victimhood? Kind of. Is that what's going on? It's the moment where they realize that all the excuses they've told themselves and all the justifications they've had for why they're not thriving and not living their life on purpose have all been false or at least malleable. And they can't come up with any more excuses. Yeah, They can't come up with those stories without immediately being able to say, but wait a second, that might not be true. But wait a second, no, I couldn't. Have I tried that? Like they start going through these processes and it's like, shit, for the last decade, that's been my jam. That's been my story. Mm -hmm. What the hell do I do with myself now that I can't cling to that? It just creates a huge void. It creates a huge void, right? And so it's cathartic, right? Uh, We know it's going to happen. Um, we're well equipped at this point after doing it for, you know, a decade and some change. But that's, you know, so much of this process of finishing your best work. Like one of the things I'll tell people, David, is like if you're planning and it's you're not going into an emotional space, it's not creating some grief, it's not creating some tears and frustration, you're not really planning. You're playing, but you're not really planning because if you really plan, you really prioritize, you really triage, you're going to have to let go of something that matters to you. You're going to have to deal with some of this, some of these real human constraints that we deal with. And if you don't, then probably you're going to either not really be making a plan or you're going to be making a plan that's not going to work because reality can constrain us before it it elevates us. And so, yeah, we know that process is going to be there. And and to your point earlier, it's usually mentioned, what do you know? Your question is, what do you do when you figured out that that's that part of it is just sitting with that. And not necessarily trying to fix or change the past and, and understanding that going forward now, what are you going to do different? And so much of the book, you know, I give tools and strategies and tips for what to do, like build a success pack. And it's just a group of naysayers, or excuse me, a group of yaysayers that you bring around you 
that remind you who you are, that remind that have your back, that can help out with the project. But the other thing about your success pack is it's kind of like once you commit to creating a success pack, you can't turn around. You can't, you, there, there is no retrograde motion unless you tell that pack, like, this is no longer a priority to me. Mm-hmm. That accountability is there. You're, you're going to disappoint them or something if you don't go forward. Is that what you're saying? Well, you're going to disappoint them, but they're also, if you pick the right people for your success pack, they'll be able to like basically hold up a mirror to the head trash and bullshit you're saying. It's like, look at what you're mm-hmm. saying. Is this true? Would you say this to your daughter? Would you say this to your best friend? Would you say this to me? And the answer is almost always no. Yeah. Right. And so, okay, I am not going to allow you to say it to yourself. We're going to sit here and have to deal with it, right? But that story that you just said that like, oh, like if I commit to this project, it's going to be more boring. You know, I'm going to, it's going to be drudgery. What you basically said is that you have a failure of, of, of imagination about how you can't find wonder daily in this work. That's what you've told me. So you're telling me you, you, this hyper creative visionary person can't found wonder and curiosity and joy and love in this project on a daily day basis. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's like, well, I can't, I know I can do that. So it's like, all right, so why aren't you doing it? (laughs) Right. What's really going on here? And then we sort of go back to that head trash and competing priorities and things like that. So that's where that goes. But I mean, this is something that I struggle with so much as somebody who, you know, marches to the beat of his own drummer. I live in a different country. I'm I'm indie, right? I, I trail my, I, I blaze my own trail. I, I do a lot of things on my own. I have a traditionally published book, but now I've I'm doing more self publishing, and that's where I often check myself, and I'm like, well, wait, why are you going at all this stuff on on your own? Is is it is it because you're really getting? what you want out of here. Like there's a lot of great reasons to self-publish, but there's also a lot of great reasons to traditionally publish. And some of it's hard and some of it's boredom and drudgery and some of it you can have stories about. And I mean, that's just like one of those cases where I really can't, I can't separate where I'm right from where I'm bullshitting myself. I don't know if you have any insight into something like that, especially as, as, as an author yourself, you know, maybe you, this is a, I think this, you have a publisher for this. How do you decide between, oh, I'm going to do this my way versus I'm going to bring somebody in on this? Now, I just realized I just created some false dichotomy that you might, <laughs> you, you might, yeah, I'm just going to be quiet, go right? I'm just going to be quiet and let you work your way out of this. <laughs> Seriously, right? Because if you're, if you're open for it, well, we'll go there and you'll edit it out if you're not. And maybe I'll get mad and like on you or something. You will. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first time. So, do it. yeah. What's really going on there? That I struggle, I mean, that I, I struggle to reach a point as a writer where, where I feel like I can get up every day and write and explore the topics that I feel like are interesting to myself. And just, it's like I, I'm not writing to make money, I'm making money to write. Okay. And when I think about doing a traditionally published deal, there's all these things involved where you you have to make this um, this uh, proposal, which is a very top-down J mm-hmm. activity that I struggle with because you have to write the whole book before you write the proposal. And then you have to pitch Hold on, these... Pause. Is that true? Essentially, I mean, you have to be capable of writing the entire book. Capable is different than have to write the whole book. Capable... Wait, okay. Now, now capable, by that I mean like the the architecture of the book is in your mind, not like capable, like I can sit down and write and, and do the discipline part of it. Like I, I can do that. I feel confident in that. Okay. But, but it's sort of like this, this, this idea that creating it, you're also creating yourself. Mm-hmm. That is, tends to be my sweet spot in, in writing a book is mm-hmm. that there's a discovery process there. And I don't necessarily know what it is until I've created it. And so, that's the point to which it's true. Like it, 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 it might not be true for some books. Okay. Well, so I've yet to really feel what the real tension is here. Uh huh. Well, sometimes I feel like, oh gosh, I could maybe be more successful if I pushed toward the traditional publish thing, but along with it comes these delays in, in how long things take, or I, I find I have a hard time finding 
traditionally published books in my genre, honestly, that I would want to read myself. And so I'm like looking at the options or imagining the options that I might have and thinking like, well, I don't think that stuff is good. Now, am I bullshitting myself? Do I really not think it's good? I mean, I'm not reading it. I think it's a lot of it's a bunch of blog posts with 250 pages worth of filler. And I mean, that's my actual behavior. I don't read those books. So this is just a place where I check myself sometimes where I'm like, well, you know, it's possible for you to be as successful as you want to be self-publishing. Well, what, what does success? So there's two different, there's several things going on here. Sure. One is having a clear idea of what your unique success matrix looks like. Okay. Yeah. And you may be the type of author, and I'm not trying to say this in a less than way, but it's just we have different types here. That you can say it in a less than way if you want. That's fine. No, there are some. <laughs> there are some of us who like traditional publishing is great for explanatory writing, meaning you know a thing, you're going to explore that thing, especially for nonfiction. You're going to explain that thing to other people. Super great for that. Sometimes not so great for exploratory publishing. Uh, exploratory writing to where you're figuring out what you think as you write it, Mm -hmm. right? You're figuring that out, but it doesn't mean, it just means a process switch for you, right? You're the basic bullshit story that you're saying that, that you might be saying before you start your next book is which pathway do I want to go? Cause that's going to determine how I write the book and what, what my steps are at the same point you could, I don't know how long you've been in this sort of, in, in this sort of quagmire, You could just commit to writing the damn book, write the book, and then say, you know what? Is this something that I want to partner with the right agency with or the right um, publisher with and find that person? Or do I just want to publish it by myself? Yeah. Right? And either option is super valid. I've seen like some nonfiction authors, and I'm assuming I'm saying nonfiction because fiction writing is different, right? And so I'm not going to go into into a realm I'm I'm not super grounded in. That's where we are. Yeah. Yeah. And nonfiction, like, I know of authors who have written a, who have gotten a, po- a great book deal without writing a single sample chapter. Right. Mm. So that's why I'm saying it's not, you don't, you don't have to write the book, right? You, do you need a good concept and a good table of contents and a good sort of flow? Yeah. You need, you need to show that you have a book and not just an idea. Yeah. So there's a wide range of options there, but I, I think a root level question that you have underneath all of that is actually what type of creative partnership is best for the work that I'm doing. And you might determine that the self-published, build your own team, get the exact people that you want is the right creative partnership for you. You might also think, you know what, actually... Ex- traditional publishers sometimes bring in expertise and things that I don't know and think about. They bring in additional resources and things like that. Having them on my team would make the project better. It will right. take longer because collaboration always takes longer, but it's worth it. And it's not like you're not going to be writing, David. It's not like you're not going to be doing these types of interviews. It's not like you're going to stop working one way or the other. Right. Right. Um, it's just what's the right pathway for you. So I, again, I think. You've let the how, you've let the how distract you from the what and the why. Well, the the how distracts you from the what and the why. Well, I'm still, I'm still doing it. And I think part of the reason why I'm even bringing this up is I actually went through a long period of being dead set on, okay, my next book's going to be traditionally published. And I started going down that road and there were parts where I was just like, you know, this doesn't feel right. And once I let go of some of that bullshit, yep. then things started to work. But that, but then, of course, you know, because this is how I like to think about things, I'm always asking myself whether I'm bullshitting myself. Then, I, then I've got to think, well, wait, wait. All right, well, there's certain things that I learned in deciding well, I'm going to do this on my own. But is there some other way? Now I'm like, well, now am I bullshitting myself about being you know, indie. So it's just a, a a check that I try to make regularly. And it's interesting that sometimes you can say the exact same stories, it seems, about integrity or 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 fear fear of success or 
you know, something affect something's going to have some on your on your relationships in certain ways of doing things, and and you can be right about that. Yeah, but you can also be bullshitting yourself, and so that's where I'm like, where's the line? Yeah, I totally get it. And first off, I think it's you know one of my favorite quotes is from Bertrand Russell. Oh yeah, and the quote the quote is the trouble with the world is that fools and fanatics are so certain of themselves, and wise men so full of doubt. I think it's healthy to always be sort of questioning like, oh, am I in alignment, basically, is the way that I would say this, right? Am I in alignment? Yeah. Is, is, is what I'm doing in alignment with my values and priorities and the way I want to be in the world, right? Which is, I think, a, a more powerful question than am I bullshitting myself? Because you can always, like, as soon as we introduce the specter of the devil's advocate or sort of we go into that headspace, we can make all sorts of cases of why we're right or wrong. And I think most of the time we're choosing from the wrong place, i.e. we're choosing from our head versus listening to, I'm going to sound very woo and very self-help here, but listening to what our hearts and bodies are telling you. Because your body really doesn't lie, right? If you learn to sense like when, you know, where pain and discomfort and the unsettledness and things show up in your body, like when you're off course, you'll feel it and you'll be like, oh, wait a second, something's up here. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can pay more attention to that. Or when you know that uh, when you know that you're either demoralized because of the way that you're doing something or energized because of the way that you're doing something that's coming more from the heart space, then that's a better sign than in your head. Like, what's the best strategy? What's the best way to do this? What's the best story? Right. Um, because that's a never ending circle, right. Of just going back and forth and back and forth. And that fundamentally distracts you from the work at hand. Right. But then it gets difficult because I, I think, you know, I, I think fortunately I'm mostly past this, but a lot of people struggle with it. This, this idea that if they're not enjoying it, that that automatically means that it's not the right thing for them. It's not their passion. Oh, I hate right? that and, one. And then Oof. it gets uncomfortable, right? Yeah. It gets, un- it's a, it gets uncomfortable. So, you know, telling the difference between, hey, you know, this whole trying to boast about my credentials to New York publishing agents doesn't feel right. I don't feel like I'm being myself. This doesn't feel right to me. And 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 finding a, a, a different way of doing things, you know, it's, it's different from, oh gosh, you know, I don't feel like writing today. And so therefore, I shouldn't be a writer anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, so... Yeah, I absolutely think they're two different things. One thing that I would say is that as creative folk, learning to tell true stories about our work and our portfolio and our body of work is one of the best lessons we can have. And so I think many people end up in this scenario, whether it's a book proposal or whether it's some other type of sales thing where they feel like they got to pump themselves up and like tell untrue stories and things like that. Or you could just show the receipts, you know, you can just say, here's what I've got. Here's who I am. Here's what I'm doing. And frankly, if it's good enough, it's good enough. And if it's not, it's not. They're not the right partner, right? You, show the receipts. I love that. Yeah, show the receipts. And so, you know, it's a Muhammad Ali quote here. They ain't bragging if you can back it up, right? <laughs> and so show the receipts. And so when you go into a process like this, if someone's like, well, why should we work with you, David? It's like, well, I've written this first book. Here's how well it did. Here's my podcast. Like, here's here are the receipts. <laughs> um, I'm not making this crap up. Right. You either believe me and you think it's worth doing or you don't. And if you don't, there's no amount like it's going to be out of character for me to bullshit you to try to tell you something besides what I already am. I'm either enough or I'm not. I'm good with that. What are we doing here? Because you, David, have already committed that like you can go either way. Right. (laughs) Um, You Mm -hmm. can you can traditionally publish or you cannot. And so it's a it's a sort of different scenario. And to to the the previous point of like, you know, that. If it's, this is why when I mentioned earlier, why I make a distinction between difficult and hard, it's kind of like the Buddhist difference between pain and suffering. Pain is kind of what happens to you. It's the bare feeling. Suffering is the story that you put on top of it, right? The sort of existential, psychological, spiritual, emotional stuff Mm -hmm. that you put on top of it. Yeah. Right. I think we use hard in the same way that we, that, that, you know, I'm using suffering. Uh, Like, oh, it's so hard. Versus if we said it's difficult. Yes, it's difficult, <laughs> but it doesn't, that's not anything about you and your relationship and whether you're worthy and whether it's the right thing to do. Like some shit's just difficult. That's why a lot of people don't do it. Right. So the question is, 
are you going to try to do this difficult thing and accept the consequences of it being difficult? Or are you going to phone it in? And if you phone it in, that's okay. Like if you decide that's not the path you want to go on, but don't go into something that's difficult and think that it's going to be easy. That's a root of suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm sorry on a little rant here because th this whole thing is tied to, and especially in the creative world, it's tied to the, the talent myth, which also pisses me off, which is a talent myth. And we all know the talent myth is like, you know, there's that sixth grade kid that was a prodigy when they were young at whatever it was. And they were good at it and they got praised for it. And what we sort of intuitively picked up is that if it's a talent, if it's your thing, if it's like your calling, it should be easy because of like prodigy, that little kid, right? <laughs> if you have to work at it, um, maybe it's not your thing. Maybe there's some other thing or maybe you don't have it. It's complete and total bullshit, right? Um, the most talented people, often the people who just have more butt and seat time and they've done more deliberate practice, right? But we never... I'm not, I won't say we never, but a lot of us don't give ourselves the chance to go through that first part of it when it's hard and we suck at it to get to the point to where it's good and we're great at it, right? And anything worth doing well is worth doing poorly in the beginning. But yeah, I hate that. Like, oh, it's, it's hard. So therefore it's not the right thing. I'm like, not necessarily. Like if it's emotionally hard and you're thrashing, Maybe it's the exact right thing to do, because guess what? You're probably going to come back to some version of that thing three or four years from now, right? These, these thresholds we're talking about with, with our own personal development and our own creative work, we either cross them by doing the work, or we end up on this cycle of maybe every three or four years, people know what their own cycle is about this, but they keep coming back to that same spot and not crossing the threshold, which ends up leading a life of resentment, a life of sort of not feeling like you've done your full potential or you've lived up to your full potential of that longing to do the thing that matters most to you. So my point here is like at a certain point, and I know I have a military background. I know all the different objections that people tell me about this, right? But I'm like, <laughs> are you going to do it this time or not? Because if this has come up multiple times in your life, if the book has come up multiple times, if the starting your business, if the starting the nonprofit, if the getting a better job, if, you know, getting into a long-term relationship and moving to Columbia, if this has come up multiple times, guess what? It ain't going away. Either do it intentionally or intentionally decide that you're not doing it and why you're not doing it. Oh, that was wonderful. I didn't think this worth doing is worth doing poorly in the beginning, I think is, is what you said. That is a nice bow to wrap up this fantastic conversation. Charlie Gilkey, the book is Start Finishing, How to Go from Idea to Done. And the podcast that you have is Productive Flourishing. Where would you like for people to get more of you besides those places? Yeah, if you're digging the book or you like, like the idea of, of it, you can go to startfinishingbook.com. You can get a free chapter see what the book is about there. All of my work lives at ProductiveFlourishing.com because I'm not good at being all over the place. And so with one of those two places, you can learn more. And, you know, what I sort of want to leave people with is just remembering that finished projects are the bridge between the life you currently have and the work you're currently doing and the life you most want to live and the work you want to do. So how are you investing your time on those projects that are building that bridge? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlie. David, thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Charlie Gilkey. Listen up, I have an important announcement. Charlie will be the last guest for a while. I'm going to repeat that. Charlie is going to be the last guest for a while. That's because for the next several months, Love Your Work will be essay episodes only every two weeks. Now, why would I stop doing interviews for the first time in four years of Love Your Work? It's because I am dedicating every ounce of my energy to my upcoming book, and this is a big one. It is very highly relevant to these work-from-home times. I want you to have the first chance to read it. The new book is called Mind Management, Not Time Management. If you feel like you have the time, but you struggle to find the energy, this is the book for you. And I'm offering a very special preview edition of the book to my loyal listeners. Read the chapters that are available right now and get the rest of the chapters as I finish them. Months before the first edition comes out, the first edition, which is included with your preview edition, 
It's at kdv.co slash mind. And if you struggle to keep going when the unexpected comes your way, check out the latest chapter, Creating in Chaos. Things do not go as planned. That is the plan as we have all been learning. Now learn how to go with the flow to get into the flow and even turn adversity into opportunity when chaos comes your way. Learn more and buy at kdv.co slash mind. This is a limited time offer. I'm closing down sales soon. At that point, you have to wait until fall to grab the first edition. So do buy now. The book is Mind Management, Not Time Management at kdv.co slash mind. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our top Patreon supporters, such as Jeffrey Mason. The theme music for Love Your Work is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>